Hello everyone, and welcome to another Windows Phone 7 video here on Channel 9. My name is Yohai Kiriadi, I'm a technical evangelist working on Windows Phone 7. And with me today, Amit Chopra. Please introduce yourself. Hey, good morning. Uh, my name is Amit Chopra. I'm part of the Mobile Platform and Tools Group, which is part of Visual Studio. Our team has been responsible for providing developer tools for the Windows Phone and Windows Mobile Platform for almost a decade. Uh, I'm currently working on the managed designers inside of Visual Studio. And I started first working on this group four years ago when we first introduced smart device extensions in Visual Studio 2003. Cool. Our developer experience has come a long way the last four releases. And one of the big contributing factor for that has been the emulation experience. So today, uh, I have two of my colleagues uh, from almost 10,000 miles away in the Hyderabad office of the India Development Center where the development of the new Windows Phone emulator is taking place. And I let uh, Mukund and Raghu introduce themselves and then talk to you about the various capabilities that we have now added to the product. Excellent. Guys? Hi. Um, I'm Mukund. Um, I'm the developer lead for uh, Windows Phone emulator project. So I've been working in this team since the VS 2008 days. Earlier, I joined in the ARM emulator team. Um, so once we started working on Windows Phone 7, uh, they have been, um, you know, looking at the ways to go improve the performance, and finally we realized that migrating from ARM emulation to x86 virtualization is going to fetch us that performance improvement. Uh, since um, we are anyway talking about uh, managed programmability for um, application development, uh, the processor architecture doesn't matter. So given that everything, we migrated to this, and uh, I've been since since then since for the past one year. I've been working in the Windows Phone Emulator project. Our team is basically comprises of around um, four developers, um, uh, plus, uh, I, I mean, in addition to me, myself. Um, so here I have uh, Raghu. Uh, hi, guys. Uh, I'm Raghu, a program manager in the Windows Phone Emulator team. Uh, so as Mukul was mentioning, we have been on this project for about a year, and it has been an like, amazing um, experience so far. Sorry. Um, so before this, I was uh, in uh, Windows Phone Devices team, uh, working with Motorola, helping ship uh, the Moto Q, Q9H, and so on. So from going from that point of working with OEMs and uh, building like native code, been long by we, we have seen the experience of like using emulators and the experience that our partners and developers uh, are looking for and what you need uh, in having a compelling uh, emulator platform to uh, build their applications and uh, as well as like uh, test all the code that they're uh, writing on. Uh, so we'll go into detail as to like what we have been, uh, what we've been doing so far, how we have built this architecture, and um, uh, and uh, all the experiences that uh, we went through for the past one year. So um, thank you and uh, welcome. Yes, and again, thank you very much, uh, everyone. Uh, you guys uh, in India, it's, it's I know it's very late already. Uh, the crew in here who uh, went through a tremendous setup to make this happen. Uh, thank you all. So uh, let's start. Uh, so you all of you are working on the development platform tools yes. uh, for Windows Phone, and specifically on the Windows Phone emulator, as the introduction did. Uh, so before we actually go and dive, deep dive into the emulator itself, what can you tell me about the emulator? What is the emulator? Okay, uh, so I can take this question. Yeah. Um, so Windows Phone emulator, um, as the stands today, is essentially a virtual, a virtual machine that is running x86 code of uh, Windows Phone 7 OS. Um, it actually is based on uh, the Virtual PC 2007. Uh, it uses the virtual assistant environment from that, and uh, we emulate all the peripherals and uh, and then the whole the, the experience along with it. Uh, we'll go into deep dive of that, uh, but I'll actually explain to you like why we did, uh, why we had to go through this emulation, and so so uh, before, as Mukund was uh, mentioned before, that uh, previously we had ARM-based emulators for uh, for uh, developers to actually do their native programming as well as do the driver development as well as uh, Build manage applications on top of it, and the biggest pain point that everyone had was that the performance of their applications on the emulator, uh, the experience that uh, that a developer would experience on the device doesn't match with what you see on the emulator, and that was the key pillar and the key goal that we addressed as part of this whole platform. That uh, the as a developer, you go through the the iterative developer cycle as you code, you build, and then you debug, and then you deploy the app onto the device or to the emulator, and then you debug it. So uh, 
So when you deploy an app onto the emulator, you see a certain sort of experience, and then when you go further deeper and optimize your performance, what we want to give is complete the cycle there, where in the experience you can see the experience on the emulator, see how your app is performing, and then try to correlate that with how you see it on the device and experience it, rather than that always uh, you use emulator just for uh, making sure that uh, the app builds, but then you always need a device to actually verify that the experience matters. And we want to complete the cycle with the emulator itself, and that's the key pillar. Uh, so we emulated a bunch of peripherals, the key peripheral being that we have now uh, networking enabled by default. You don't have to do any configurations or anything like that. So it is a bit of like proxy settings or whatever is the network profile that you have on your uh, host PC. Whether you have Wi-Fi, you're behind a proxy, you're behind a VPN, you're behind a... Um, you know, whatever is your network area. So we uh, we try to enable uh, networking by default to you with no configuration required. And the key other key peripheral that everyone uh, talks about is the GPU as well. So we emulated the whole uh, graphics processor in the virtual environment. Uh, Mukund will go into detail as to how this is laid out and how we are able to do that. And as well as the cool UX experience that you're seeing with the emulator, wherein uh, it's, a, uh, it's a virtual... Uh, uh, it's a native application just hanging there, just like feeling, giving you that cool metallic look and uh, just standing out there in the middle, in the host PC and trying to make you feel that it's actually a true device that you're working on. Cool. So, so just yeah. taking a, a step back for a second here, um, you guys are actually saying that the emulator is running basically the full image of the Windows Phone 7. And once we release, uh, the, uh, the, you know, the final version of the tools for this release, uh, it will run basically the same image as a Windows Phone 7 device, real device runs, right? Technically, yes, but if, if you really go and like look at the key difference, the key difference being, as we have been mentioning, the processor architecture. And that, as you mentioned earlier, that shouldn't matter because from an um, external application development story perspective, it could be managed story, so the processor difference is abstracted by the CLR, so, though the underlying OS processor architecture is x86 for emulator and ARM for real device, from an application development experience perspective, it doesn't matter. So, it's the same. Yeah, that's the only key difference between device and emulator. Right. So, the, 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 key, the key takeaway here as far as developers, if you're writing something, uh, something some application using Serverlight or XNA, which is managed, which run on top of the CLR, you don't really care what is the emulated uh, environment underneath that. And the same app that they're running, the same code will run as is on the, emulator, on the real device. Okay. So we, before we dive into the specific details of the, of the emulator, how it, how it, how it actually builds and, and run uh, on the x86 environment, uh, what is so special about this version of the Windows Phone 7 emulator? So the main benefit of Windows Phone Emulator is the ability for, as a developer, to run the same code uh, that you run on the device as well as on the emulator. As a developer, you build the application and then deploy the app onto the device, and the same app deploys on the emulator as well. It's the same code that gets deployed on both the places. The other key benefit that you actually have is the emulation of GPU peripherals, where all the FX and uh, that you uh, that are possible in Cellulite as well as the XNA gaming. Are uh, are uh, visible on the emulator, uh, and you can visualize them, see how you, uh, how the how they actually render on the on the device, on the emulator, and and then essentially extrapolate that uh, behavior onto the device as well. And uh, and the other key benefit that we offer you on uh, on uh, devices that are uh, on host PCs that are capable of multitouch is the ability to do the gesture on the host PC for the emulator and see your app experience and the flow of the app in the emulator itself, and then uh, mm -hmm. using the multi feature that we enable, and then relate that to the your device experience as well. So I'm actually going to take you now to the PC that I have. Uh, I have a HG, 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 quick demo of the three features that I talked about. Um, and then I have, what I have here is the uh, HP the Smart PC. And um, so here is um, an application that is uh, running, uh, uh, this is a little bit app, and um, so what you have here is uh, a device toolbar, which essentially shows you uh, Windows Phone 7 emulator here as well as Windows Phone 7 device. Um, so I choose Windows Phone 7 emulator. I press the start debugging, which would go ahead, connect to the phone emulator that is currently running, and deploy the app onto the emulator. And then uh, what you see here is, uh, so this is a similar like this application. Um, that is, uh, and you can see the experience that we had, uh, the, the perspective transforms that actually got rendered as well as uh, uh, 
on the emulator itself. So you can see uh, when you're building an app with all these cool animations and so on. So you can see the experience on the emulator as well as the portable view here. As, and if you want to scroll through stuff, and then uh, so you can scroll through that. And this has the panorama uh, pivot control, uh, which essentially is to, uh, helping you to actually look at. So I'm I'm not doing anything. I'm not using mouse at all. I'm touching onto the screen, see the experience of uh, how the app behaves on the emulator, and then see the same touch experience on the device as well. Um, so I'm going to go to um, the app right now. So so this is. Uh, I'm going to stop debugging for the similar application. I'm going to bring up Fire Up and XNA game um, that we have. And then, uh, so from XNA, so I have uh, a simple uh, application which essentially shows the effects of XNA um, that are capable, uh, that uh, that Windows Phone uh, can actually support. Uh, it's, again, uh, it's again building the application, um, so you cannot see that, but it's essentially showing that build, build is built and then now it's saying deploying to start in and deploying onto the emulator. Then let me open the pack. Um, so it's deploying the application onto the uh, emulator. Deploy succeeded, so it finished the deploying, and then it's now going to launch the app onto the emulator now. So uh, this application, again, just like the light, has, um, so what you see here is a 3D version of a tank uh, that is being rendered on the emulator. It has all the, uh, the shaded effects as well as um, uh, so it goes through stuff there, and then we, um, so I can turn on textures, I can turn on like map on, I can do some stuff there, and see how the effects actually are rendered on the on the screen. Let me go back, and then uh, I can do some, and then I can do an alpha test on this guy. So we're in, uh, I have a single uh, tank which is being uh, I use the back buffer to render it across uh, uh, multiple instances of the same thing, and you can see the fidelity of the rendering, and uh, so the experience is. Uh, so you can see all the, the shadows that this tank has, a 3D instance, and then it's not like a 2D is being rendered here. And the same game, the same tank, can, uh, you can see the experience of this and then uh, relate to how it's going to look on the device. And here is uh, a 3D uh, object that is created, a body walking through, and then you can you can use the uh, screen to actually just move stuff across and uh, see how the various views that are uh, uh, available for this. And then and it gets it right here, um, and then see, yes, uh, how the object is being rendered, and then see if you have any pixelations or any uh, how the pixels are looking like, and then go and fix them. So, um, the, so I have, I'm actually demoing two things here. I'm actually demoing the uh, the uh, emulator actually showing the GPU capabilities of the emulator, showing the 3D rendering uh, using the GPU, as well as the touch effects. Uh, I'm using the touch and actually using my finger to actually see rotate this object and so on. Uh, so, uh, let me. Um, Stop the demo there. I can uh, go to IE. Fire up some common site here. Um, I'm going to pick this up and then uh, so it actually brings up the uh, here's the New York Times web page um, uh, being, being the default rendering as you see on the uh, device. And then uh, we, we, we literally like the content is not visible. So just like the way you do on the device. So I'm going to do the multi-touch, and then I'm going to use the gestures to actually, uh, the stretch gesture to actually go and read the text, just like the way you actually do it on the device. So I can do that, I can do, uh, I can stretch it, or I can actually pinch it, and then uh, the emulator would render the content. Okay, so um, uh, so the, uh, as, as I was demoing, the, the three main capabilities that we have is the ability to uh, the build, uh, build an app, uh, and uh, the same code that runs on the device can be deployed. On, uh, on either device or emulator by just the tab choose. So you choose whatever you want. You select the tab and then you can deploy either on emulator or on device. You don't choose a new project. You don't build something new. You build exactly the same code and deploy it onto the target platform there. And the uh, capabilities that the emulator is exposing, networking, whether it be is like seamless networking or whether it be GPU or multi-touch, uh, these peripherals that we are adding or enabling um, to build that developer experience and not let let developer worry about building the application rather than not worry about all the peripherals that are associated with it or uh, the functionality. Uh, just worry on functionality rather than on the fidelity or the experience of app building. So uh, yeah, so uh, we'll we'll go into a lot deeper in the architecture as we progress. Right. So so this is like been uh, this is amazing, right? It's it's 
It, it's really nice, it's compelling, it's GPU supported, so Serialite, XNA, 3D, everything just work and touch as well. Beautiful. Yeah, and probably in the future, so our additional peripherals, and we have some questions about it later. So I guess now it's the time to actually uh, understand how this thing works. How does the Windows Phone 7 emulator emulate? Sure. So we, we can probably talk about sort of a slightly higher level architecture initially, and then we can take a few peripherals. First, first initially, let's just like talk about the CPU because that's the core. And then we can talk about a few peripherals, how they actually work. That's the core principle. And from there, we can talk about what are the new peripherals that we added and stuff like that. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll start with the um, architecture diagram. So the core, as we talked about, the core component of uh, emulator is the CPU component. So what we have as core is this x86 core. And here is where we leverage the VMM technology from uh, Virtual PC 2007. So, so what we have is a small layer over here. This is the shim layer. And that is the one which is going to go talk to the VMM layer over here. So to abstract all these things, what we have over here is a conference that sort of abstracts uh, memory, CPU execution, I/O management, and interrupt delivery, all these things. So this is what we call, this whole block is what we call as a core system. So on top of this, what we have is a set of peripherals. So all the things that we talk in terms of, hey, be it a timer or an audio uh, in or audio out peripheral, a touch peripheral, network peripheral, all these things are like you know, small components that sit over here. So we can have audio over here, networking over here, um, touch. All these peripherals basically sit on top of this I/O or interrupts. So basically, if you look at how the uh, system actually starts executing, so there will be like you know when when you go and like load the OS image, there will be something like an initial instruction that you start. So what we simply do is. We take the OS image, load it into memory, we allocate one physical chunk of memory, and we say that, okay, so load the OS image into the memory, and then we go and like, transfer the control to the CPU, saying that, okay, so start executing from there. When we say start executing from there, what we are really talking about here is that we transfer the control to what we call as guest context. So before like you know, proceeding further, let me just like, give a brief description of the terminology that we are using here. When we talk about guest, what we are talking about is the context of Windows Phone OS is what we call as guest. So when we talk about host, what we are talking about is the desktop PC, which is actually hosting this virtual machine, is what we call as the host context. So, so in that, what we are seeing during the startup is we have loaded the OS, the guest OS, into the memory, and we have transferred the control to the CPU. So when we do that, what actually happens is the execution actually happens in the x86 core. The virtual machine manager driver which is basically a kernel mode component on the desktop PC that's the host side. That's where the execution actually starts. So that switches to the guest context, executes the guest code, and then um, so we load the page tables, so on and so forth, and the execution continues. So the initial part, that's the bootstrapper that we call, is something that is specific to emulator. That's not something that is shared with a device, obviously. So once that execution starts, we go and like transfer the control to the kernel. From that point onwards, it's the OS code, Windows Phone OS code, which is shared between, the, at least at the source code level, they are shared between the device and emulator. So that happens. Once that happens, what's going to happen next is the individual device drivers will get like loaded. So the, the, the individual device drivers are the ones which basically abstracts to the OS all the access to the individual peripherals that we are having. Each and every peripheral that we have is something that is exposed as through a set of what you call the um, hardware registers that you will talk about on a real uh, board uh, is what we emulate here. So the driver will be talking through this I/O management interfaces. Through that particular thing, they'll be communicating. Basically, it's nothing but memory managed uh, memory mapped I/O or port I/O. What we use in the case of Windows Phone emulator is basically memory mapped I/O. We use memory mapped I/O. The individual drivers will use memory mapped I/O to communicate to the host side emulated hardware registers to go access individual things. And as you can see, right, so that's the way in which the guest OS is going to go communicate to the hardware. How will the communication will happen from the host peripheral? Let's say you have a, 
uh, network card or something, which wants to go raise the internet saying that a packet has arrived. So, or let's say a GP is going to say that a particular operation has completed, or a touch peripheral is going to say that a touch point has arrived. All these things is where the internet actually comes into picture. So, the uh, VMM component that we are having here provides us those interfaces through which um, the, the, the uh, peripheral implementation on the host context is going to go notify to the guest context that, that the interrupter is available. So what we can do probably here is we can just like go and like separate out the host side and guest side separately and we will say when you actually interact with Windows Phone Emulator, what are all the set of events that happen on the host side and how the corresponding flow happens to the guest side is something that we can talk about. Yeah. You guys, uh so you guys had to deal with uh, both drivers, right? Uh, drivers for the host and driver for the guest side as well. Um, so the, the host side component will be something like, um, it, it, we don't have to actually call it as a driver. It's more of a peripheral implementation. It's just uh, a device implementation versus calling it as a driver. So for example, the VMM component that we talked about is actually a driver. Right. Okay. So, so let me let me give a context here, right? So when we talk about touch, we'll be using the drivers, touch drivers that are already part of the way. We don't go implement those uh, driver on the host side. We just use standard Windows API to go get those information. So if we talk about multi-touch, we use the touch API of Windows 7 and get all those information, right? Uh -huh. So and that is what is emulated through the hardware register to go pass the information. And the guest context is what is going to go listen to all this information that is coming from desktop and it's going to go act on those things. So probably if they go and like, you know, separate between the host context and guest context and do one flow completely, we'll be able to go understand. Okay. So since that's being something which is simple and something that they can, um, you know, relate to very easily, um, we will talk about touch as an example here. So let's just like separate the whole thing into two area, one being host context and the other being guest context. Um, so this, as we talked about, this is the desktop side, and this is the Windows Phone OS side. So as we, let us assume by default that the core system is sitting over here, which is trying to do all the services for us, right? So on the host side, what we are going to have is we will be having the UI thread here. This is where, so if you if you see what the emulator is made of, you can see that there are like three windows. There is a skin window, and then there is a window for the LCD rectangle, and then there is this little menu bar window on the right hand side, right? So the LCD window is the one which is going to go listen to all the touch events that are happening on the host side, right? So from this thread, and then we have a separate thread here, which is our CPU thread. So this is executing in parallel, right? So the user interacts with this, going and like touching or doing any operation. So that is going to send touch messages to the UI thread. So then what we do is we go take these things and then pass this information to the core system here. The core system is going to say that I have some information to go pass to the touch driver. So that's what, that's the interrupt that this UI thread is going to go generate. In this case, what we are talking about is the touch peripheral that we have implemented over here that is running in the UI thread is what is going to generate the interrupt. The core system will go interrupt the guest side, guest side execution. So that context, that execution is happening in CPU thread. Is going to go interrupt the execution here and it's going to say that, you know what, I have to go and execute the interrupt handler code. So that's where the control will happen. So on the guest side, the corresponding, we will be having the touch driver here. And if you see what this touch driver is actually having, it's simply a thread which is waiting for the interrupt event. Once the interrupt is like hit, it's going to go pull the current um, you know, coordinate and it's going to go pass that information to the input system of Windows Phone OS. So what is going to happen here literally is interrupt this case. Once the interrupt this case is going to go and like put the device, it's going to use memory map IO here, and it's going to go and like tell this um, um, touch peripheral that switch to, instead of being in interrupt mode, switch to sampling mode. So once it is in sampling mode, what this guy will be going and doing is, it will be going and reading. So it will be, there will be a, you know, sort of, we have a timer there. And using the timer, what we do is we go and like pull the hardware registers for what are the current samples that we are getting. So once the user takes all the fingers off, that means 
there is no more um, you know, data to be sampling. So what we do is we simply switch to internet mode, right? So that's what is effectively, that's the state transition that happens here. So if you literally see what happens in a peripheral implementation, these are all the things that happen. Firstly, if the peripheral implementation that we have on the host site have to communicate to the guest site, it's going to go raise an interrupt. And that interrupt is something that is abstracted by the host system. And uh, the driver that we are having on the guest site is going to go use memory map IO to communicate to the host site to go get all this information back. So that's where we go and like pass the information about the touch coordinates to the guest site from the host site. So this is one very simple example to go and like show how the um, information from host site is getting passed to the guest site. So the same example you can go extend it to GPS or any of these uh, peripherals. So any situation where you say you have some data on the host site that you want to go pass it to the guest site, you can go and like use a combination of interrupts and memory map that you want to go pass the information. That's the core principle that we follow. So the code system already abstracts these views, so we have something to go execute. The uh, interrupt and I/O together provides us the ability to go and do a communication between um, host site and guest site, and that sort of completes the loop for a single paper. The same fundamental principle is applied across all the variables that we are having, which also includes GPU. Cool. So when we consider GPU, right? So GPU in itself is a uh, you know, pretty pretty large component, and we can have a separate discussion to go and like talk about it. But what we can probably do right now is to go and talk about just the core principle that we followed. So the principle that we followed for uh, GPU is pretty much similar to the uh, model that we followed for the networking component as well. So the current networking that we are having actually shares the networking capability from the desktop connection that you are having. And the GPU, what it's going to go do is, it's going to go share the GPU uh, capability that you have on the host machine and sort of expose it to the guest site. So that's something that we can go talk about as the next, um, you know, example of uh, another peripheral implementation. Okay, again, we'll just like fit it into host context and guest context. So before that, just to like, you know, brief description of what, um, you know, the GPU thing is all about, right? So typically, as with any other peripheral, GPU also has a uh, uh, device driver that we go implement. The device driver that we implement here in this case is a user remote driver. The one that you actually um, saw for touch is basically a kernel remote driver, whereas in this case what we are having is a user remote driver. Um, so which, once we say it's a user remote driver, it's more like you know, it, it's getting loaded into individual applications. So if you have like you know sort of a.exe or like one SL application in each and every SL application instance or each and every uh, SNA application instance, we are going to go load this driver. And that driver um, is going to be this user mode component, as we talked about it, and then we have a corresponding kernel mode component. So this kernel mode component that we are having is a very thin layer, which just like exposes certain you know, key features, like how we go and like communicate from um, the uh, user mode layer onto the, uh, the hardware implementation that we are having here, and also for allocating physical memory and things of that nature. So that's what we really go and do. So if you see like, you know, what is actually required from a driver perspective, uh, for, for, for a, a GPU driver perspective, we have to go implement DirectX. I mean, as in like, you know, D3D API is what we need to go expose. The driver model is basically a D3D driver model. So that's this user mode driver component that we are having is basically the D3D user mode driver component. So this driver component is going to sort of forward all the calls that are happening on the guest context forward it to the kernel mode driver. And kernel mode driver is going to use this FMIO technique to go forward that information back to the host site. And on the host site, what we do is we sort of have an implementation where every user mode driver call, we have a corresponding API level implementation which sits on top of D3D API. So if you are like, you know, well versed with uh, what the driver model of D3D, you can see that they are pretty much similar. The uh, user mode driver interface and the API interface that we are having are similar. Exception being there are a few, there are quite a few operations where you cannot just like take it for granted that they just like work seamlessly. That's, that's, that there are like two key challenges that we need to go and like, uh, you know, deal, deal with here. So one being, whenever we go and say, we have to go um, use um, 
in a sort of texture here on the guest side, we have to go and allocate a corresponding texture on the host side. So it's more like for every object, every D3D object that we allocate on the guest side, the corresponding host side object is created. So then the problem becomes something like if there is anything that changes on the guest side or on the host side, how do we maintain the synchronization between the two? That's the implementation design that is implemented in the peripheral uh, layer and the user mode driver and the peripheral layer actually work together to go maintain the synchronization. So we have a sort of a uh, state model where we actually go and track what are the changes that are happening and based on that we go figure out what are the what is the best time for us to go synchronize the difference between uh, the guest side and host side and we do that. The next challenge if you see it's more like all the applications that we see are like you know sort of full screen uh, full screen applications. Let's say that your application is running and suddenly there is a you know sort of alert or something that comes or a phone call comes. So in that case what you have to go do is you have to go and have an overlay on top of um, the uh, primary screen where the texture or the or the output from some other application needs to be composed on top of the current application that is running. So there are certain semantics that we need to go and take care of between coordinating the output of the shell and the output of the application and combine them together and render it on the LCD screen that you see. As you can see, the LCD rendering that we are having is completely a D3D based rendering that we are having if you have GPU enabled. So, so that's like you know, sort of a high level description of you know the, the two key challenges that we had in GPU and the overall flow of how the execution happens from the guest side to the host side. And that's that's the two examples, one being touch and second being um, GPU. So this would have given you an idea of you know how in general the core execution happens and how a typical peripheral implementation happens. And if you have to go implement any number of other peripherals, the core concept being is two. That's it. So that that will give you a pretty good idea. So this is uh, really, really impressive. Uh, so basically you're saying that the emulator, the, the main uh, LCD display uh, has, uh, the main display is a basically a DX surface. And you guys are basically doing all the, all the combination, all the uh, uh, com combining the different events and the different parts from the guest and the host together on that surface through That's the emulator. Right. That's right. Yep. So, sir, but the, the key point here being, if you have GPU enabled, yes. as you might have noticed by now, there are cases where we don't, we won't be able to enable GPU. For example, if the host machine doesn't have GPU capability, then we won't be able to support it. And we have a minimum requirement as well. Uh, if that requirement doesn't meet, then we won't be able to go enable GPU. In those cases, the fallback will be for the older display model where it's more like a flat display driver. So, um, the guest side will be using the old GDA model to go render. And we simply go and like do a simple scan line based rendering on the whole side. So we've just seen how the emulator works internally, and I have to say it's fascinating. I mean, uh, the way we uh, leverage uh, Windows 7 capabilities or Windows and all like yeah. GPUs uh, and uh, and touch and all of that is like really really cool. So we understand we have a host and a guest, and, and basically the host is the Windows machine and it uses all the underlying infrastructure and services like network and touch and file system. So if you could guys give us a quick recap of all the peripherals that we are actually using on the host. All right, so, so um, the first being, like, we, we talked about touch and uh, GPU. We briefly touched upon networking. We said that it's sort of the mo overall model being similar to GPU. And uh, then we have the audio, obviously the audio in and audio out. Um, then we have um, the device system flash. So what we do is we go and like emulate the flash peripheral on top of a file. So any operation that you do, any any file based operation that you do, is actually getting persisted in a part of a overall single file. So it's more like a file system inside a file. So that's what we basically go and emulate. That's um, for the flash. Um, then we have like simulated peripherals like. You know, the orientation, whenever you want to go change the orientation, we sort of go and like do something like a uh, orientation sensor. And then we have battery, battery as a sensor, and we simulate backlight. So so those are the things that we sort of simulate, though they are not like a true blue uh, peripheral that sits on top of a capability from desktop. It's more like a simulated thing to go experience what would really happen on a real device. Right. Yeah. Uh, I because eventually we have the set of API that we need to support. They want to project something which is close to real, close to real scenarios. Absolutely. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. Right. So, so I, ultimate, the ultimate goal being anything, whatever is the behavior that you would expect on a device is what we want to guarantee as, you know, exhibiting on an emulator as well. So as a developer, you should be able to go say that till it goes to the last stage, you, you should be able to be confidently say that if it works on emulator, it's expected to work on uh, the device. So, so you should be able to go push testing on device towards the end. So that's, that's the whole idea. Right. So... Coming to that end, I'm sure that many of us are here want to ask, and many of our viewers are actually wondering, so what is the performance impact? I mean, does it run faster or slower than a real phone? What are the memory consumption uh, aspect? Can we some way profile that? Can we get some feel from running on the emulator, uh, which will actually run on the device and compensate for that? Oh, yeah. So, so um since this is a sort of a virtualized um, environment, right, so the key thing that really gets impacted is the overall performance throughput of the emulator system is completely controlled by two aspects of the CPU, one being its speed, obviously, and the second being the hardware capability. So as you might know, right, most of the reason processors actually support hardware assist, right, so the VT-enabled, uh, um, you know, CPUs. So on those CPUs, so it, there is a BIOS setting, which you know, on most of the client PCs, that comes disabled. So what you have to go do is you go enable hardware assist. Um, mostly the performance that you'll be getting on a real device will exactly match, uh, will almost match what you're actually seeing on emulator. They'll, they'll more or less match if you go and enable hardware assist. Uh, without hardware assist, you will see a performance drop, particularly if there are a lot of memory-based operations that are happening. You will see a performance drop. If it is more compute-oriented, you might not see that much uh, performance drop there. But the moment you go enable hardware assist, as I said earlier, uh, the performance should almost exactly match um, what you would get on a typical Windows Phone high-end device. Yeah, just to add to what Google was mentioning, um, so one is the, the CPU bound operations, which uh, use the hardware assist virtualization. And the second is the GPU bound operations which use the physical, uh, the host GPU for all the GPU animations that, uh, that are going on. Um, so currently we don't throttle that. So, uh, so the, so the answer in the question that, uh, Yoshi is asking like, uh, so is the performance really, uh, is not like one to one mapping with what you see on the device, but based on like, in the case of GPU, in the case of GPU, but uh, based on like how the device profiling is going right now, the experience like with uh, um, the, the animation speeds closely match in the virtual environment. What we are seeing is that closely matches what you see on the device. Uh, so it's not like 100% guaranteed, but uh, we try to match as much as possible. So to a human eye, you probably wouldn't see the difference between what you see on the device versus what you see on the emulator. So, so if you want like short answer, short answer would be something like if you execute a lot of code which doesn't have you know, G animations that use GPU, and if you have hardware assist enabled, the performance will almost match device. If you use GPU, then, and if you have a pretty good GPU hardware on your host machine, then it will definitely execute much faster on emulator than on device. So that's the key, uh, this thing. So the second question that you were asking was around memory footprint. So one of the earlier, you know, one of the diagrams that we were drawing was the core system, where we talked about the four pieces, one being memory, uh, one being CPU, obviously, uh, memory, I.O. and interrupts. The key component that we talked about there, which relates to this one, is memory. So, as we talked about at that time, so we go allocate that memory in one chunk. So, the allocation that we actually do is physical memory on the host machine, which means the moment we go allocate, that memory is chopped off from the rest of the system. So which means, let's say you have a machine which has 2 GB of RAM. If you go and like start emulator, what is going to happen is it's going to go take away somewhere around uh, 700 MB of physical memory away, including the working set and stuff like that. So 700 MB is out of your system. So this sort of, if you think about it, if you have, let's say, Outlook running, if you have VS running, and if you have like, too many applications running, it really puts the pressure on your uh, system. And the next thing is, when you have GPU enabled, what's going to happen is every texture that we allocate is actually getting allocated as physical memory. Corresponding physical memory needs to get allocated on the host machine as well, right? So there also you will have a memory impact. So given all these things, the typical recommended configuration when you have GPU enabled as well as when you have the system enabled will be um, somewhere around 2 GB of RAM uh, will be uh, preferable and you will not like face any trouble there. Okay. So, perfectly understood, you would might expect some, uh, if you have a strong host machine and you have a capable uh, DX 
uh, DX card, you're probably going to get a boost in the performance, uh, which makes sense at the end of the day. Uh, uh, so, which basically but, but that, that's where the key point to note here, right? Which means if you see, like you know, when, when your when your GPU hardware is really powerful on your host machine, you want to be you want to be careful about what is the type of um, you know, uh, particularly this impacts XNA scenarios. Yes. So you might have since XNA applications really go and dunk all the calls to the host side and it's ex it gets executed there, um, you might want to be very watchful of the throughput that you are getting on uh, emulator. You might feel that, hey, everything is fine and it is running fast, but when you go and take it to device, it might get slowed down. So this is right now uh, important to go note when it comes to GPU. So right. XNA development scenarios, that's something that you, you, people need to go watch out for. So basically, as far as a great emulator that this is and a tool and an enabler and Folks can actually start today writing application. Don't have to wait for devices. This thing just works. You know, the final step before actually deploying this or pushing this to market, it will be to actually test this, uh, test the application, test the test the game, test it on a, on, on a real device, just to make sure that everything works properly and as expected, and the throughput is proper as within the boundaries that you are willing to accept and so forth. So. As much as we love whatever we discussed so far, still the final stage will have to be a test on a real device. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. The, the functionally, you don't need to. Functionally, you don't need to. Uh, but when it comes to performance particularly, it's preferable to go and like do the final validation on a device, only around performance. Yes. Yep. And the, our, the whole goal is related to push that testing onto the device as late as possible in your, in your iterative development cycle and use your emulator for your primary development when you're uh, uh, figuring out the functionality and your basic assets and how they are laid out and all the performance and so on. So once that is all done and before you're, you're, you're kind of like satisfied, take the device, do, uh, do your testing there, make sure that everything is fine, and then go to the injection pipeline to, to the market. Yep. So uh, with that, guys, I want to, uh, before I actually want to thank you, I just want to ask if you have any any final words to recap or to summarize what we have seen so far? Oh, um, so, well, so one point that we need to talk about here is about the limitation part. So as you might have seen, you know, um, we do have a limitation that you know, we run on Win7 and we run on Vista, and we don't run on XP right now. Uh, while technically there are no limitations per se, um, there are obviously, from a CPU capability perspective, we, we did talk about what are the things that we put in terms of the CPU requirements and stuff like that, uh, the, the the biggest worry that we have is that on XP machines, we don't think you know the, the, the CPU capabilities could be very high and stuff like that. So that's still you know the jury is still out. So we still have to go make the final decision on that and stuff. So we are still working on that. The second being on the GPU front, one thing that people might have noticed and people might have had heartburn in the past is around uh, the dependency, the requirement that it needs the, the card needs to be. Uh, DCD 10 capable, basically DirectX 10 capable, and uh, the driver model should be WDDM 1.1 and stuff like that. So that's the requirement that we are actively working on to see something like how we can go reduce the uh, requirement that we have on the host machine's capability so that on more and more machines we can ensure that all the capabilities that we would want developers to go experience is actually accessible. So that's uh, one of the key points. So we might expect that uh, as we further go along and, uh, and the release get closer, we might uh, reduce some of those limitations. Absolutely, absolutely. We, we are working on reducing the limitations one by one, and uh, as, we, as things like pick the bar, we definitely will go and address those things. Cool. So with that, uh, Mukun, Raja, I want to thank you very, very much for taking the time, staying up uh, so late at, uh, at India. Uh, Amit, thank you very much for thank coming you. in and hosting us. And uh, again, I hope you guys enjoyed it. It was, a, I think, fascinating overview of the Windows Phone 7 emulator. Uh, we'll definitely have more videos on that specific topic as time progresses. And, uh, and again, watch us for more uh, Windows Phone 7 videos here on Channel 9. Thank you. Thank you.